This is the Merlin. She was built in 1930 to transport sand and she will be my home for the next week. We're sailing 420 kilometers across Germany and I'll be sharing the ship with just 23 other guests. I'll show you what it's like to live on a barge, what we eat, where we sleep, and how a brilliant husband and wife team run this business with just four other crew members and their dog Sasha. We can't forget Sasha. This cruise was anything but ordinary and our time on land was mostly spent on bikes cycling every day through German towns and countryside. The time on the bike definitely was a challenge for me but we saw some bizarre and incredible things along the way that distracted me from just how long I'd spent in the saddle. Our cruise began in Dusseldorf on the bank of the River Rhine. Usually when you board a cruise you have to start your journey by going through security and joining lots and lots of queues but that is not what happened on the Merlin. When we walked down to the river edge, the Merlin was already waiting there for us. There was no big cruise terminal, no buildings, the ship just docks right on the river's edge. The ship looked beautiful, the paint looked flawless, and compared to the other river ships that I'd seen around, the Merlin looked absolutely tiny. You would never know that the ship is almost 100 years old though, I'm sure she's had about 100 fresh coats of paint in that time. We walked right onto the ship and that was it, our cruise began. It was one small step for me and I guess a giant leap for a cruise kind maybe. <laughs> I was taking this cruise with my dad and it's very rare that I spend time with just my dad so I was looking forward to that and I was really hoping that he would enjoy it as much as I thought he would. I'd booked this cruise for us about a year in advance and I'd spent the last year telling him how much he would like this so I really needed it to be good. We chatted to the other guests on the open deck area and I found out that there were people on board from the US, from Canada, from Australia, from Brazil, and me and my dad were the ones who were there representing the UK. The front terrace area was beautifully decorated with these little flowers and lots and lots of comfortable seats. Our cases were taken and we were shown to our room by one of the owners of the Merlin, Christina. Christina bought the Merlin in 2019 with her husband Kuhn and since then they've both lived and worked on board full time. Having direct contact with the owners of a cruise ship isn't something that you usually get. Usually the owners of a cruise line are so far disconnected from their fleet of ships, but I knew that they were there and that I had tons of questions that I wanted to ask. From what I remember, 2019 doesn't seem like a fantastic time to buy a business in the travel industry. I feel like something something happened in 2020. Kuhn and Christina actually met working on board another river ship and they took a huge risk giving up their jobs, giving up their home and buying the Merlin. But more about that later. Our cabin was bright, it was spacious and we had a porthole that looked just over the waterline. We could see ducks going by here sometimes, which was so cool. Every cabin has its own bathroom too and it was much bigger than some of the bathrooms I've had on ocean cruise ships in the past. The shower was massive and there was plenty of room here to get changed afterwards. Looking into the toilet next, as you do, I suppose, I realised that the water in there was slightly brown. My first thought was just someone forgot to flush or oops they forgot to clean this toilet but I was wrong about that. The toilets on board actually have river water in them and to me that makes perfect sense. There is no need for the water in toilets to be of drinkable quality and when you're on a trip like this on a barge you have to plan where you're going to get fresh water from so it makes sense to use the river water where you can. No it didn't smell like a river, it smelled lovely. I love this colour yellow in the cabin and unpacking was the easiest thing ever. The majority of my suitcase was full of cycling clothes so it was more of a question of you know which cycling t-shirt am I going to wear today rather than what do I want to wear. I did pack a few dresses and a few normal t-shirts but they really didn't take up a lot of space and I am a fan of packing light so this worked very well. To cut costs I do use public transport wherever I can and it's just so much easier when you don't pack so much stuff to kind of stand by your suitcase on the train. We unpacked into the shelves on the side and left some things in our suitcases under the bed. I bought my Captain Hudson suitcase with me and our channel mascot Captain Hudson was with me me every step of the way. Hudson has been cruising all over the world but I thought this might be his first time cycling. Not that he would cycle of course, he was carried around by me the entire way which must have been nice. After unpacking we were all invited into the main lounge for a welcome talk. I loved the design of this area and it really felt as though a lot of thought had gone into the decorations. We were introduced to the crew and we had a glass or maybe two glasses of Prosecco to start our cruise. I was so excited but I was a little bit nervous about the amount of cycling on the schedule. I could not be described as a cyclist by any stretch of the imagination. Definitely not. I had noticed the bikes out the front though, they were there and they were kind of looking at me, challenging me. I knew though that I could take a rest day if ever I wanted to, nobody is forced to go cycling at any point and there's plenty of things on the schedule that are not cycling related. 
Some people do come on this cruise and they stay on board every day, which is totally fine. The ship usually won't be sailing all day, so people will kind of come and go whenever the ship is docked. Next on my to-do list was food. The way that it works on a barge is that there's a set three course meal every day for dinner and the menu is put on this board a day in advance. The idea of set menus does normally make me feel a little bit nervous, but if we saw something that we didn't like, we could talk to Christina and she would make us an alternative if possible. For example, if you saw the menu and you saw that tomorrow's dinner was lamb and you really didn't like lamb, you could have the vegetarian option or something else. You just need to tell Christina. On the bigger river cruise ships and the ocean ships, you'll usually have a menu that you choose from, but with 24 guests, that just is not possible. I cannot imagine a single dish that I could cook successfully for 24 people and have every part of that dish hot at the same time. That's really tricky, let alone a three course meal. So I was very impressed with all the food on this cruise. Christina is the owner of the Merlin and also the chef on board along with about 20,000 other jobs that she does. You would expect that if somebody had so many jobs, they might not be fantastic at every single one, but this first meal proved that Christina was a brilliant chef. We had a sweet corn soup to start, beef or tofu bourbignon for the main, and an apple strudel to finish. I'm amazed that I managed to say the word bourbignon there. That was very good. Proud of that. I hoped that the rest of the food would be as good as this first meal, and I knew that the food was not just for the enjoyment of eating it, but also it had to be the fuel for our daily excursions. Staying on a ship of this size does mean that you get to know every single other guest. You eat together every day and normally you're out cycling together too, so you get to know everybody very fast. It's easy to get lost on the big ocean ships with thousands of people, but on a barge of this size you see the same people all day every day. Everyone in our group seemed lovely and really interesting, so I was looking forward to getting to know them a little better. I didn't imagine that the barge would have had a kitchen like this when it was originally built in 1930, so I was keen to learn about what parts of the ship were new and which were original. It turns out that if we did manage to transport back in time 97 years while at dinner, we would just be sat in a big pile of sand. This section in the middle was added later and it now has all the modern essentials like a big TV screen here that showed us our itinerary and a coffee machine that was used a lot. The beds in the cabin are also brand new and they were very comfortable. When I first climbed into the bed, I had no idea that it was an airbed, but I did find a remote control in the bedside table, which made me think. I was so happy to find a plug socket down by the bed so that I could charge my phone, and there were a couple of lamps here too, which was really nice when you were kind of winding down in the evening. Kuhn told me that last year when he decided to change the beds, he was able to donate all of the mattresses to Ukraine. They were all of great quality, and that's the kind of nice thing you can do when you run a small business like this. You don't have to get any paperwork signed, you don't have to ask anybody for permission, you can just have a good idea and then just do it, which is kind of how Kuhn and Christina ended up with the Merlin in the first place. Our morning started with a breakfast buffet and our guide Leah gave us a presentation about the bikes and about how cycling through Germany would work. Leah would guide us across Germany every day and make sure that we had everything that we needed. Luckily for us she had a lot of knowledge about the bikes and we would need that a few times during this cruise. Leah would literally put herself between us and cars and if that's not going above and beyond for a job I do not know what is. We cycle mostly on bike paths along the canal or through the woods but we did spend some time on the roads too. Germany is so well set up for bikes though that we almost always had a path to cycle on or if we didn't the cars were still very very nice to us. I loaded up my bike with my bag, my lunch and my Captain Hudson and then we headed out. In total we cycled 57 kilometers to Munster which is the furthest that I've ever cycled in my life. My thighs were on fire trying to keep up with everybody else but I felt so accomplished when I got back to the ship. It's not often that I push myself with a challenge like this so I was very proud of myself and I was also very proud of my dad who seemed to just find this so easy. Seeing the ship waiting for us when we came around the corner was just incredible and I did get to thinking I wondered what did Kuhn and Christina do during 2020 when cruising shut down completely. In 2019 they'd quit their jobs, they'd sold their home, they'd put everything they had into the Merlin and then there was a global pandemic. Being ever entrepreneurial, they decided to open up the ship as a floating restaurant for a little while before they could resume sailing, and they even had to operate a little one-way system in the barge, which must have been very tricky. Luckily, the Merlin does have a section down the side so that you can wander back around that way, and I would often hear Sasha, the ship's dog, wandering along here because my cabin was just underneath. Her little tippy-tappy feet were so cute, and she was always so well-behaved. 
Sasha has always lived on ships, so she's totally used to it. She gets loads of attention, she gets fresh air, and she gets walks in interesting places every single day. I think that is the perfect life for a dog. I did wonder where Sasha actually lived, but I would find out later. Even though I was tired at this point, I knew that I would need my legs again because we had a walking tour booked in the evening with a local guide. We headed into town after dinner and we learned a little bit about the history of Munster from our local guide. The town was funded in the year 793 and no, I didn't miss a one off of that. 793, over a thousand years of history in this place. This is the exact same spot now and back in 1900. Incredible. I don't think that they had this restaurant here in 1900, but I filmed this because it seemed very fitting given how long I'd spent in the saddle. The tour lasted around an hour and then we headed back to the ship ready to recharge for the next day. It was the second day that I made a decision that would change the rest of my cruise and it is one of the best decisions that I've ever made. I decided that I would try an e-bike. I've never been on an e-bike before, but when Leah said that the second day would be as long as the first day but with more hills, I thought I'm going to give an e-bike a go. The Merlin has 11 e-bikes on board and they can be reserved at the time of booking. They actually show you your speed too and the highest I ever managed to get to was 42 kilometers an hour when I was going down a hill. As somebody who doesn't cycle, that felt so fast and I was genuinely holding on for dear life. It was so much fun though, I had forgotten how fun cycling is. Now walking seems so slow and so boring. I am so glad that I did try the e-bike. It was basically like having superpowers. It isn't like riding a scooter or a motorbike. You are still cycling, but it just makes you feel as though every pedal you do is so much more powerful. I honestly don't think I would have made it up some of those hills without the extra power. We were on the bikes for four or five or six hours a day, which when you're not used to cycling, that's quite tricky. During our cycle, we did come across this incredible contraption. It's kind of like a trike that's very, very fast, but kind of like a car. I think I would be terrified about being so close to the ground and going so fast, but the man who owned it stopped and talked to us about it and he was very happy to kind of show it off. The people of Germany were so friendly and I couldn't believe the respect that they showed to cyclists. We would stop in random shops, we would stop to taste the fresh strawberries and everybody would let us sit and most importantly they would let us use their toilets. Passersby would stop to give us directions or just to chat about where we were going. It was really really nice, it was lovely. We went to this restaurant that kindly let us eat our pat lunch inside as long as we bought a drink. I tried a German cola and although it wasn't a patch on Pepsi Max, it was still pretty good, it was nice. Every day we were given a little pat lunch to take with us out cycling. It usually was a sandwich, a snack and a juice and we could of course bring any other snacks that we wanted or we could buy things when we were out like when we were in this restaurant here. Every morning after breakfast we picked up our prepared lunch bags and they already had our names on them. The red labels mean that you have some sort of dietary requirement like vegetarian or gluten free. It was on this day that a friend of mine was sat under a tree eating his lunch and a bird was in the tree and unfortunately it pooped right onto his lunch bag. I don't think it went on the food, but talk about being in the wrong time at the wrong place. When I booked this cruise, I let the team know that I'm vegetarian, so every day all of my meals were the vegetarian option. The dishes that they created were from all over the world, and I've cruised a lot. I'm used to a lot of cruise food, but this was a step up. This was really good. Everything we had was fantastic every single time, and I never heard a single person complain about any item of food, which is a miracle. I don't think that's ever happened on a cruise. In the reception area, area of the Merlin there was a coffee machine, a water machine and on top there were lots of random biscuits. I don't think that many people found the biscuits but I did and every time I picked one up I was hoping for a custard cream. I did get lucky sometimes with the custard creams and they'd often have things like cake or cookies on the bar when we came back from our cycles. On the opposite side is a TV screen that showed us the day's itinerary and a map so that we could see where we were going. On the right and left here are the stairs to go down to the cabin and these stairs are really steep. Some people went down them backwards, more like a ladder. It's important to make sure that you can do stairs like this before you book a barge like this. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to get into your room and you would probably have to sleep in Sasha's bed, I don't know. That is one of the tricky things about barges. They can't always be accessible to everybody. A friend of mine on board did bang his head when he was going down these stairs but that wouldn't have happened if he just had his helmet on. I'm kidding of course we didn't normally wear our helmets inside but here I am demonstrating it. Kuhn and Christina bought the Merlin when she'd already been converted into a passenger barge, but a lot has changed since then, especially in this main dining room area. This is what the Merlin used to look like around 10 years ago. 
still lovely of course very very lovely but i think the new layout and the design really does kind of elevate the space i did notice our mascot captain hudson was working behind the bar i guess he was working on this pole and that's not mine this is the merlins they have their own captain hudson we would usually come back from our cycle and we would sit around here around the bar chatting so i'm glad that we had the space to do that everybody would congratulate each other on the ride and chat about things that happened during the day it didn't take very long to get to know everybody else we would kind of high five each other as we cycled by some people would be singing while cycling it felt great to be part of that group and i think the act of completing something each day brought us closer together i made an effort on this cruise to speak to every other guest and normally that's not something i can do on a cruise i can't speak to four five thousand people but i could speak to everybody on this cruise and a lot of them said that the best thing about this was getting to know the other passengers and also the crew and i would agree with that it was a really nice group feeling it was so relaxing to sit in the main dining room here as the ship sailed by we would often be sat at dinner and coon would be up there sailing the ship to our next destination so we would have a constant show of scenery there isn't any entertainment like a band or a theater or anything like you'd find on big cruise ships but to be honest that would just be a waste if we were docked we would normally go for a walk and if we were on board we would just want to sit here with a drink and look at this going by we would always be docked overnight and quite often we would sail over dinner and then dock again in the evenings on one of our walks Coon showed us this amazing area where a canal actually goes over the top of a river. Yes, you heard that right. A canal over the top of a river. I can't even imagine how heavy this top part must be, but it's probably best that you don't think about that when you're standing on the top part. Also in the evenings, we would have a talk from our guide Leah, who would explain what was on the schedule for the next day. She would show us the map of where we would be cycling and where the Merlin would be going, and importantly, our end point. Both Kuhn and Christina are riverboat captains and they speak so many languages too. It's really impressive to me how they can fit so much in their brains, but they're just very, very clever people. Our guide Leah is very clever too and we did need her the next day. We weren't that far from the ship when one of our bikes got a flat tire. Luckily, Leah had everything she needed to repair the bike and she did have to repair a couple of flat tires during our cruise actually. It all gave us a good excuse though to get some ice cream and to spend some time sitting in the sun while she fixed it. The weather was in the early 20 seas, which was perfect for cycling. Most days we cycled between 45 and 60 kilometers over around five or six hours, I would say. One day we had a couple of hours in town in the middle of the day to explore, and another day we found this lovely beach to have our lunch on. I found a boat here called Emma, which did seem like a sign. I don't know what the sign was saying, but I took it as a sign that I should have a lion tomorrow and that I should stay on the ship. In the UK, we would call this bunking off. You would say that I'm gonna bunk off cycling tomorrow, or you could possibly call it skiving, and that is your Britishism of the week. If you decide not to go to school or not to go to work, you're skiving, you're bunking off. I've heard the phrase playing hooky, I think, from the US, but that is not something we say here. It is skiving or bunking off. Let me know what you would call it in the comments because I'm curious, it's interesting. Most days on this cruise we'd be up around 7.30 and we'd set off cycling around 9 or half 9. Breakfast was served between 8 and 9 a.m. and although I'm really not a breakfast person, I thought it was important for this cruise so I did always make an effort to have breakfast. Christina would make all kinds of food including eggs and pancakes and all the usual things you'll find at breakfast like cereal and breads and cheeses. Everybody managed to find something to suit and there was always the option to make yourself a sandwich or to take a piece of fruit and to add that to your pat lunch. I quite often made myself a Nutella sandwich or a Nutella sandwich depending on how you want to say it and I ate that in addition to my regular sandwich. It was quite funny to me to see how everybody would make trades with their snacks. I got a Snickers in my lunch bag one day and my dad loves those so I traded that with him and sometimes you would see someone has two packets of M&Ms, someone has two bananas and you can see something's happened there. Of course if you get something you don't like you can ask Christina to change it but I did think it was funny how it kind of turned into a currency a bag of M&Ms or a Snickers. I did bring some cliff bars with me too and I only really eat these when I'm exercising but they made the perfect cycle snacks because I could put them in the handy pockets that are on the back of my cycle t-shirts. It is such a handy place to have pockets. I think more t-shirts should have pockets on the back and I might start a petition. Add pockets to the backs of t-shirts. 
I'm from the UK and here when we say half nine, that means half an hour after nine. If a German was to say the same thing, they would say half nine, but it would mean half the way to nine, so 8.30, which is pretty confusing. I think us Brits and Germans have a lot in common, but some things we just seem to do the opposite way. I don't know why. I did wonder if it might be a little bit weird being on the barge by myself as my dad still wanted to go cycling, but it was absolutely fantastic and it was just what I needed. It was great to have a day where I didn't have to wear padded cycling pants or cycling gloves or anything like that. I wore a dress and it felt fantastic. I spent the day sat out here on the front deck and it was like I had my own private barge. The bar was closed during the day but I could still sit inside if I wanted or out here in the sunshine. I took the opportunity to film the ship without the other guests on there and I called my mum to let her know how my dad was getting on. While I was out of the cabin it was cleaned as it was every day and the ship was absolutely spotless. I loved how the soap was called Soapy too, I think that's just a genius name for a soap. I could see the world go by from my porthole and sometimes when we were docked, I could see out and onto land. I did love watching people as they walked by the Merlin. They would really try and peer in and it was cool to be the person who was in looking out. I told my mum that my dad seemed to be having a good time and that he seemed to be finding it quite easy. I knew that my dad cycled but I guess I just didn't really realise how much. It was such a relief to me to see him enjoying it as I'd spent that full year telling him how much he would like this. That is what cruising is all about for me, it's getting to experience new things with the people that you care about and making memories that you will not forget. I definitely won't forget the afternoon when after our cycle ride we went to visit the Volkswagen factory. Here we saw this very cute little car and we walked these cars being fired up and loaded into their parking spaces ready for new owners to collect them. I'm not sure if you can get an idea of scale or speed in this video but it was seriously impressive and each one of these towers they have two each one holds hundreds of cars. You can buy tickets to go on a ride up here actually but we were having a tour with a guide so we kind of had to move on. There were lots of other things that we needed to see like this flower walkway and these globes under the floor. When I was on board the ship I had a chance to talk to Kuhn about the Merlin and her history. It turns out that she started life as a barge called the Adler, which is Dutch for eagle. I'm basing my pronunciation of that word off of this one video that has one star, so please bear with me. Google Translate says Adelaar. You can pick either of those, that's fine. But her main job was to transport sand and stones through Germany and through the Netherlands. This part at the back is where Kuhn, Christina and Sasha now live, and this remains pretty much unchanged. But this entire midsection was created to add cabins for the passengers and the main lounge and the kitchen and everything else on board. The front is pretty similar though. The ship was converted in the early 2000s and named Merlin or Merlain, depending on how you want to say it. It's named actually after the wizard and the tagline is the magic of water. It's Kuhn and Christina who manage every single one of the bookings, they sort out the routes, they work out how to get things delivered to the ship, they manage the crew and some of the crew have actually been on board longer than Kuhn and Christina, they basically came with the ship. It sounds like a logistical nightmare and I have no idea how they organise it, but I'm very glad that they do. They also have to plan where we will dock the ship when we sail and Kuhn actually grew up on cargo ships, so I suppose it's kind of second nature to him. For me though, the idea of sailing a ship, especially through a lock, is terrifying. When you reach a lock, it'll suddenly get very, very dark. If you're at dinner, it's weird, but if you're in your cabin, it is even stranger. What happens in a lock is that the ship will sail in, it's then sealed and the water level will raise up or drop down so that the ship can carry on on the next river. It's basically like a lift or an elevator, but for ships. The Merlin sails from spring to autumn and during the winter Kuhn and Christina live on board and they spend their time renovating the ship and planning future itineraries. On our itinerary I cycled a little over 250 kilometers, which is definitely on the higher end of some of Merlin's itineraries. Every single itinerary is on their website and they put together very detailed plans of where you'll go every single day. You don't get this on an ocean cruise. This cruise cost me around 250 euros per person per night and that is based on two people sharing a cabin. In total for the seven night cruise it came to 1740 euros that includes the accommodation the daily tours and all of our food the only things that i paid extra for were the drinks from the bar and also the tips for the crew i tipped 10 euros per person per night for the crew and the same again for our guide leah of course this part is optional but seeing how hard this team worked and how much they cared about this cruise meant that i was very happy to tip that 
They work incredibly hard and they have no days off. As soon as they've got rid of the passengers, got rid of sounds mean, as soon as they've disembarked the passengers in the morning, they have a few hours on board and then the next sort of passengers arrive. They don't have days off in between cruises. They cruise, 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 cruise. That price doesn't include any flights. That's just for the cruise. But getting from the UK to Germany, it's only about an hour flight. So that wasn't tricky. The cruise was a similar price to my first river cruise with Emerald. There was no cycling on my Emerald cruise, but they did have a swimming pool that turned into a cinema in the evenings. To find out what that cruise was like and what it's like cruising on a river cruise ship with over 140 other guests, check out this video next.